Sasakwala and Elie Wiesel founded Forum 2000 for a purpose. The world is upside down. How should we put it back together? Are we able to act responsibly? Can we work together, play by the rules, and restore solidarity? Let's use this crisis as an opportunity. A new world emerging? Watch the online Forum 2000 conference, October 12th to 14th. Hello and welcome everyone. It is my pleasure uh, to be hosting this panel uh, for foundation and platform to promote democracy and young democracy, support civil society, respect for human rights and tolerance, cultural and ethnic tolerance in young democracies. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists where today we will, we will be discussing uh, a very interesting topic regarding populism. And we will be focusing on two of the largest uh, Latin American countries that have elected populist leaders from opposite ends of the ideological spectrum. Um, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador in Mexico City, um, Bolsonaro in Brazil, and Mexico, sorry, and Bolsonaro in Brazil. Um, so I will in briefly introduce both our panelists. Uh, Marco Antonio Fernandez, who is a research professor from the Tecnológico, uh, from the Tecnológico de Monterrey. He holds an MA and a PhD in political science from Duke University. He obtained his bachelor's degree at the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México. He currently works as a research professor at the School of Government and Public Transformation at the Tecnológico de Monterrey, where he coordinates the Initiative for Education with Equity and Quality, and an associate researcher at Mexico Evalúa, where he coordinates the anti-corruption and education program. He specializes in both education and it is also my pleasure to introduce, and I'm, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Sergio Fausto, who is the general director of the Fernando, Enrique, uh, great, <laughs> Fernando Enrique Cardoso <laughs> Foundation in Brazil. He is a contributing expert for the Latin America Initiative and an executive superintendent of the Fundazao Instituto Brasil Enrique Cardoso a think tank and presidential library founded by the former president of Brazil. He co-directs Plataforma Democrática, an initiative devoted to strengthening Latin American democratic institutions and culture, and is co-editor of the book series O Estado da Democracia na América Latina. He is also a member of the Gassint USB, a group that brings together academics and policymakers to follow and assess international relations at Universidad de Sao Paulo. Fausto is a contributor to O Estado de Sao Paulo, one of Brazil's leading newspapers, and frequently comments on domestic politics and international affairs in the media. So let's briefly begin. We have, we have many uh, issues to cover, a lot of material to cover, and we have little time. So I will begin just giving a broad scenario, and I would like just to take the, the, the take on, on both of you. Um, just as an introduction, uh, what elements explain the rise of these two populist leaders in both Brazil and Mexico. And in allowing these populist and personalistic leaders to come to power, 
who were the main supporters that that uh, voted for them in the electorate? And do you see any change in their basis of support over the past years? Please, uh, Marco, can we begin with you? Yes, of course. Thank you so much. Well, I think that uh, that above all, I mean, uh, the big victory that uh, President López Obrador obtained in uh, the summer of 2018 is uh, a mirror of different factors, uh, among them uh, profound dissatisfaction uh, with democracy and uh, uh, the then ruling party PRI and the former ruling party, party PAN. Uh, high levels of corruption uh, that have uh, increased public uh, anger, a um, uh, problem of, of uh, a politics of resentment in that sense, because we have seen that uh, despite economic reforms in, in the country established for the last 20 years, there, the changes in the figures of poverty levels have, uh, have not been uh, quite substantial. So in that sense, I mean, he took advantage of that uh, anger and dissolution with, with uh, uh, other parties and basically uh, uh, had a huge victory, obtaining majority in, in, in Congress and in the Senate, and in fact having strong uh, majorities in several of the state uh, uh, congresses that also had elections uh, back then. I mean, among uh, when we observe the characteristics of the electorate uh, uh, that supported him, uh, he had a huge support among the young people. Uh, he had support both uh, uh, of people with uh, a high degrees of education and low degrees of, of education. And for the first time, I mean, contrary to his previous attempts to, to obtain power, he even had uh, very good numbers, uh, not only in the traditional support bases of the south of Mexico and uh, center, but also in the north. And I think that this big uh, uh, victory is uh, like a mirror of these factors that I just mentioned. And do you see any changes in their support, in the basis of support of López Obrador over his past two years in power? Well, what we have seen in, in different surveys is that, for example, the presidential approval has been going down. Uh, in fact, I mean, in comparative perspective, he has even lower levels than one of the former presidents that he has a, a deep conflict with, uh, uh, Felipe Calderón, similar levels of a presidential approval that, of Vicente Fox. And we are observing changes in in the composition of the support base. I mean, particularly among those uh, uh, highly educated that have a, a not a doubt on, on supporting him. Well, there is a growing dissatisfaction uh, with uh, him, and uh, and he's consolidating his uh, base uh, with uh, the the people of lower income in in, in Mexico. Okay. Um. So so Sergio, uh, the the case for Jair Bolsonaro is is different, right? Because He's a radical right. Uh, how do you explain his, his rise to power and, and, and the role of the party system, as we know that it's very fragmented in, in Brazil? All right. Uh, first, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Well, differently from uh, the case of Manuel López Obrador, Bolsonaro was elected uh, by a, a tiny, tiny party. Right, Morena is has had structured itself before the election. Bolsonaro was sort of encapsulated by a very tiny party at the last minute and was elected uh, in the second round to the presidency of the Republic of Brazil. His elections is the result of of. Uh, various crises, uh, and I would highlight the, the following. First, the crisis of legitimacy of the political system. 
one should uh, remember that uh, the the Brazilian political system was severely hit by a corruption scandal um, and the investigation uh, of the Lava Jato uh, led by federal prosecutors. And uh, that uh, the corruption scandal uh, was something that hit the political system across the board. So all major political systems All major political parties were hit by uh, by the corruption scandal, favoring the case of an outsider like Jair Bolsonaro. So, crisis of legitimacy, corruption. Second, economic crisis. Uh, Brazil uh, entered recession in 2014, and it was the deepest and longest recession ever registered in Brazil. And Bolsonaro was elected in the wake of this crisis. The economy was already picking up, but in a very slow pace. Third uh, crisis. Uh, the uh, one I would, I would put it that way was the perception of a moral crisis, the dissolution of family values that led to a conservative black backlash mobilized by the evangelical churches in Brazil. Uh, the evangelical churches are growing steadily in Brazil in the last many years. But for the first time ever, they unified around one candidate to the presidency of the republic. And that candidate was Jair Bolsonaro. So he is the result of the combination of this three crises. Uh, economic crisis, uh, crisis of legitimacy of the political system, and the perceived moral crisis uh, of traditional family values in the Brazilian society. And I, I'm going to ask the same thing that, that, that I asked to Marco. Do you see any movement in the support basis of Jair Bolsonaro over the past few years? Or do you think he has just well, consolidated his popularity with them? There, no, there has been some changes in his uh, base of support. Those who were uh, in his base of support because they favored uh, the battle against corruption, this kind of moral outrage against the political system, these people were very much disappointed because uh, much to the surprise of them, Bolsonaro has, on the course of his first term in office, allied himself with all political parties. He became closer to the political establishment, who, which was the very target of his very aggressive campaign uh, during during the the, the elections. Um, so this people is alienated from his uh, base of support. The second uh, and the second uh, faction, which is disappointed with Bolsonaro were those who favored uh, new liberal policies and uh, those who saw the appointment of the as finance minister of a Chicago boy, now a Chicago oldie, uh, because he's 70 and not a Chicago boy any longer. But uh, the, 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 the power of the finance minister has been very much limited in this years uh, of presidential uh, term uh, of Bolsonaro in office. So these people, which normally those who favored uh, uh, Lava Jato and new liberal policies, they represent middle class people and high middle class people. And uh, but what what has happened is Bolsonaro has now penetrated more popular sectors of uh, of the electorate. And his core constituency is formed by evangelicals. And evangelicals represent around 30% of the Brazilian of the Brazilian population nowadays. And uh, if you if you allow me to elaborate a little bit more on that, this shift in his political base 
has also yes, to do with the, so we can go to the next with the topic. pandemic seconds, with the pandemics because he sort of found during the pandemics the holy grail of uh, relief package and the relief package proved to be very effective in earning him the support of the poorer segments of the population. Uh, before I go into, into the pandemic, because apparently for, for Bolsonaro, as, as you say, it represents sort of, it, it, it has become an opportunity or to, or to reach out to different segments of the population, right? With Lopez Obrador, it has represented a challenge in his government. But before we go into that, I, I just briefly want to touch upon a very important topic that I think um, takes us a lot into their next elections, right? And, and one of these is um, we have seen worrying trends from both of these leaders in terms of their wanting to undermine institutions, right? They try to make any institution weight. Uh, weakening them, electing people that are um, just possibly not technical, but more loyal to them. Um, they also have had very strong attacks on civil society and on any media that criticizes them. So what is your take on this? Do you think that the institutions in each of the countries that we're talking about are strong enough to endure these attacks? a crisis of these institutions. So Marco, please. Yes, well, in the case of Mexico, there is a worrisome trend that uh, has been consistent uh, since he took office because we see uh, like similar to other cases in like in the populist manual, uh, different attacks that he has done to all institutions that uh, represent any kind of of uh, attempt to to try to contempt his will. I mean, he has been very critical, for example, with the press particularly with those media that he considers uh, unfavorable to the coverage that they have, both at the national and the international level. I mean, Forma has been clearly the most uh, uh, the most seen uh, a target of his attacks, but he has attacked uh, Proceso and other uh, and, and several other main newspapers. But he has also been very critical with the Financial Times, the New York Times, the Washington Post. Then he has been uh, consistently attacking uh, civil society organizations. Even in his last attempt, he used similar to what we observe, for example, in Hungary, this uh, uh, conspiracy theory that the international organizations, foundations were shallowing uh, money to these civil society organizations to both key projects uh, of his government. Then uh, there has been a window of opportunity for him because uh, on the one hand, he has politicized some uh, some important institutions such, such as the intelligence unit uh, that uh, uh, of, uh, of finance resources uh, that basically is in charge of the investigation of uh, asset transactions, etc. And that institution has been persecuting politically some uh, people that uh, are not uh, consistent or are perceived as opponents of the president. I mean, that was the case uh, in, uh, in, in the case of the Supreme Court of one of the judges that suddenly his accounts were frozen. And and after some weeks of, 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 of silence, he basically renounced. So he had to fill in that position in addition to, do, to two other constitutional positions in the Supreme Court. Uh, 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 court. And that has been very uh, important for his, uh, uh, for, for, for his actions because the way that he has been trying to, to appeal to the public is through public consultations. And the last uh, attempt is uh, these public consultations to uh, judge uh, former former presidents and the Supreme Court support that decision. I'll go back to you, Marco, because one of the things that I want to uh, want to hear from you is whether you think that the institutions are going to endure all of these attacks, right? Because we have seen these attacks on all the levels that you have seen. 
how, how about how about you, Sergio? What is the experience that you see in Brazil? Well, I have no doubts whatsoever about the authoritarian DNA of, of Bolsonaro. And he harbors uh, clearly uh, the impulse, the desire to turn Brazil into an illiberal democracy. But, uh, but he can't do it. Uh, he had to adjust to the constraints uh, provided by, by the system. One important difference uh, between Brazil and Mexico, Bolsonaro and López Obrador, is the fact that Brazil has a multi-party system and uh, the, the president does not have the automatic backing of a majority in Congress. On the contrary, he had a minority in Congress, so he had to adjust to, to, that, to that reality. It's a federal system in which governors have uh, important powers in their hands and they, they provide a check on, on, on the president's uh, powers. So the experience here is that Bolsonaro's temptations are clear. He even tried to mobilize the, uh, his supporters in anti-democratic inst- uh, demonstrations, but the institutions reacted to that attempt and he had to adjust. One important thing to have in mind is that uh, the, the attorney general, the, the federal attorneys here and, and attorneys in different parts of the country, they still have a lot of power and a lot of autonomy. And Bolsonaro is, in Bolsonaro family, is under investigation. So he backtracked in his authoritarian uh, attempts, not out of conviction, but out of fear. And, uh, but it's, uh, it's hard to say where this will end up. I think uh, we have not reached the final, the final chapter of this, this story. And, and I think this is very important because uh, Lava Jato in Brazil was effective, right? In Mexico, we really have not seen a, a strong persecution of corruption activities, right? Marco, so are strong enough as institutions in Mexico to endure all of these attacks? I'm not sure, sincerely, because uh, in the case of the opposition parties, they still seem to be weak. I mean, yes, we have a federal system, but weaker to to the uh, in comparison to the Brazilian case. We have seen a harsh uh, uh, exchange of, of power between uh, two of the main uh, opposition goals in the case of one, uh, uh, of, of Chihuahua uh, and Tamaulipas. Uh, clearly creating a, a growing tension. Six of others in Mexico have said, okay, we're going to form our own organization of governors to try to resist the centralization process that the federal government is trying to attempt. The, the, the so-called independent bodies, such as the Transparent Institute and the Electoral Institute, have been under re- uh, reiterative attacks by, by the president. So we will see what happens in the midterms. I mean, these midterms are going to be key to see how, if if he is able to consolidate his power and even expand the number of governors uh, in in his party, or if we are going to see once and for all uh, the expression of of dissatisfaction with his own government, and he will lose the, the majority. So far, I mean, we have seen yes that his presidential program has uh, been going down, but in case of the support of the opposition parties, it's unclear that they have this enough strength. <laughs> to uh, basically get rid of, of the majority in Congress of, of, of uh, President López Obrador. Okay, and, and I think this takes us into, into like the, 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 the events that happened this year, right? Um, so both of these presidents had their agenda and they were constructing their agenda of transforming institutions, etc. And then the pandemic hit. Um, and both have terrible numbers in terms of infection and in terms of deaths, right? We are some of the worst countries in the world. But uh, Jair Bolsonaro appears to not 
struggling in terms of his popularity and a lot of the international media a lot of handouts right and Lopez Obrador, on the other hand, has suffered in his popularity because of the, of, the, of the really bad performance in terms of the pandemic. So I have two questions for you, and I will begin with Sergio. Um, do you think that the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, really hit on Bolsonaro's agenda? And will he be able to, let's say, uh, not reinvent himself, but deal with this in a way to, to, to succeed? And the same thing for, for, for Marco. Or do you see any opposition game? Let's start with you, Sergio, please. All right. Uh, he has dealt with the pandemic successfully, much to the surprise of many, including myself. And the reasons uh, why he dealt with the pandemics uh, uh, successfully uh, is threefold. Uh, first, I've already mentioned the relief, uh, the relief package, and it's interesting because that was not his idea, the idea of of leaders in Congress, and but he he sort of uh, understand that there was a an oppor a political opportunity in this, and he grabbed it firmly. Second, one has to take into consideration that uh, fifty percent or more then the Brazilian uh, population cannot afford to stay at home. So the, the, the attitude, the posture of Bolsonaro of sort of negating uh, the seriousness of the pandemics and being very much antagonistic to uh, stay at home orders uh, determined by governors turns out to be beneficial to him. And third, uh, the very process of normalization of his, uh, of his administration. Um, that is to say, less radical rhetoric and uh, trying to build a majority in Congress and to adjust to the old and tested tactics of Brazilian politics. Three, these three uh, factors made him successful in dealing with the pandemics so far. It remains to be seen whether this is sustainable over the years. There is a tremendous fiscal restraint, just to mention one, one thing, to keep the relief package at the same level that it is. it has been kept since the beginning of the pandemics. God, uh, God only knows what will happen when the relief package is partially uh, taken from uh, the poor people. Thank you, Sergio. And I think we have very little time left, but Marco, can you please um, uh, give us your, your, your take on this? So we can, as I said, we have well, little time left. I mean, yes, uh, the figures are very worrisome, not only in terms of the death, but precisely public opinion is divided in the way that he has uh, been handling the situation. Basically, 50 percent uh, uh, approve and 50 percent disapprove the way that he has handled this medical emergency. Uh, in terms of the economy, the, the numbers are worrisome for him because there is a large majority that uh, condemn the way that President Lopez Obrador has handled the, the situation. He has resisted to go into into debt to provide assistance to uh, to companies to resist uh, unemployment. Therefore, we have seen the loss of one more than one million uh, uh, jobs and uh, the forecast of a downfall uh, between nine and ten percent of GDP. So, in that sense, things don't seem to be very uh, favorable. Is near future uh, in, in political terms. Okay, so I think we, we are out of time. It was it was very short uh, panel. I think it was it was just a privilege to talk to both of you and get your take on this. Um, so we would like to invite the audience to to log in to the next panel, which is human rights conundrum in China. And thank you, Marco and Sergio, for for both of your participations. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye bye.